excited to have everyone here today. Very important people on this call. I'm Garrett Paxinger here. We have Justine Lee and also Carol Ranero. Um, as many of you do know, we're going to give everyone just a minute or two to log in and be with us. But why don't you go ahead and uh, type into that question screener where you are logging in from around the country and around the world. And we'll just give everyone a minute or two to log on and we'll do our normal introduction very, very shortly. So go ahead and type in. I can tell you right now it's eh, partly cloudy, but at least not raining here for me on the East Coast. I'm excited to not have uh, rain at this point. So <laughs> I don't know. What about you, Justine? For 80 degrees, cloudy, but beautiful. So I'll take summer whenever I can. <laughs> and Dr. Ranero, what about you? I actually have no idea what the outcome is. <laughs> I've been inside all day. Oh, no. but I think it's supposed to be uh, low 70s today. <laughs> Drove in at uh, 5 a.m., no windows in the office and uh, oblivious till you drive home in the dark kind of thing. We Correct. think we, we, all, <laughs> we, all kind of, we all kind of get that for sure. So let's go ahead as everyone's typing in again. We love seeing where you are uh, commenting from around the world. We have Florida, Jersey, Vermont, Minnesota, Arizona, Calgary, uh, Portugal, uh, Delaware. Love it. Love it. So let's go ahead and do our normal uh, little introduction as we get through this. Again, really excited to have you all here with us today, we're going to be talking about canine infectious respiratory disease and some clinical conundrums with Dr. Ranero. But a couple of housekeeping points before we get to that. First thing, I definitely wanted to give a huge, big shout out to Merck Animal Health for sponsoring today's race approved YouTube live session. This is a, a 30 minute webinar. You'll get 30 minutes, half an hour of uh, race approved CE credit. So, again, thank you to Merck Animal Health. You guys know that when we had the the fortune, the benefit of an amazing educational partner like Merck Animal Health. We're excited to offer amazing CE to the veterinary world. So again, thank you to Merck Animal Health. If this is your first Vecral event, we have uh, really a great opportunity to learn in a multimedia approach. We have YouTube live events. We have our more traditional webinars, real life rounds, podcasts, videos. We have our forum, our certificate program. We actually just launched two new certificate programs. We had basic and advanced emergency medicine, practice management, and nutrition. And we just launched two new ones, ophthalmology and anesthesia. So check out our website for the that. One, the ones everyone's scared of. Yeah, exactly, right? Who likes eyes and uh, anesthesia? Those are super scary. So definitely check out our website to get more information. But we love uh, giving great CE. This Today is one of those events, and we're happy you're all here with us today. Here's just an example of our message boards. This is a great way to whether you are you want to chat with colleagues, vent over a venti coffee, job postings, or ask medical questions, get case support from other specialists or colleagues, definitely check out our message boards and as this is live and being broadcast on YouTube, we love interacting with you on social media, whether you dance with us on TikTok, tweet with us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, gram with us on Instagram, just make sure you interact with us. We love seeing you there. Now, this is super important. Now, as I said before, this is live, this is interactive, you can ask questions. Justine and myself are behind the scenes, but here's how you get CE credit. So if you take your normal smartphone, whatever that is, you have your QR code right on the screen. So I'm going to put my phone right up to that QR code. And what you're going to see is I get a little note at the top here. If I click on that, it automatically opens to our little form here where you're going to fill out your information to get your CE certificate. So again, very easy on any newish past couple of your smartphone. Open up your camera app, point the camera right at that QR code. It recognizes it. You get a little alert. Do you want to open up this web page? You do. You click on that. Up comes our form so you can fill it out and get your CE certificate. I'll post this one or two more times throughout the session, but please make sure you get that. We'll leave this open until 1 p.m. Eastern so that it gives you an extra 30 minutes to register for your CE certificate. And then final housekeeping point. Yeah, this is on YouTube. This is a normal looking YouTube window. You see who my red arrow is. The bottom right of your screen, there's a little sort of square where you can click on that and it makes it your entire screen so it's not just a small window. So if you absolutely want to go ahead and do that, make it as big as you can, click on that little icon bottom of your screen. With that said, in a moment, I'm going to drop myself and Justine out of the window. Dr. Ranero, again, thank you so much for being here with us today. If you can give our audience a little bit of an introduction of 
who you are, where you're practicing, what you're doing, and then if you can take it away, the floor is yours. Let me know when we can advance slides and I'll be your, your IT support behind the scenes. But again, thank you so much for being here. Great, I'm very happy to be here. So I'm a professor at the University of Missouri. I practice small animal internal medicine and I teach clinical students as they're rotating through their um, internal medicine rotations uh, and then also didactic teaching of the preclinical students. So enough about me, I wanna jump right into my first slide. Um, and in this talk, what I want to do is give a very practical clinical approach to how we're kind of initially seeing and then ultimately working up these dogs with infectious respiratory diseases that are community acquired. So what I'll call SIRD or canine infectious respiratory disease. And it starts off with the clinical presentation. So you can see in this first slide that the video or the still photo to the far right is one of the manifestations of SIRD with nasal discharge that's often purulent or mucopurulent. In the second video, and we're going to try to play it here, I understand we've been having some technical difficulties. and see if that one will play. So no sound, but this dog essentially is doing the <coughs> kind of typical cough, um, often a little bit more of a goose honk or barking seal sound if they truly have tracheitis. And then if we go to the last video to the far right, um, that was a dog that had respiratory distress. So you can see that there's more labored inspiration as well as expiration. Now on the next slide, I wanna to bring together sort of that initial clinical complaint. And those are things that owners will observe at home, the nasal discharge, the coughing, labored respiration. Then we're gonna jump into a more concrete history. And that'll often start off because this is a disease known as kennel cough. It's associated with lots of dogs being together and passing the disease one to another. So you're going to ask about exposure to sick dogs. But moreover, a more important question than that nowadays as we've understood these pathogens is, are there, is there exposure to any dog, not just the sick ones. So we learned that from H3N8 influenza, where the vast majority of shedding was actually before they were clinically symptomatic and early in the course of disease. We're going to want to know a little bit more about environmental history, and that includes irritants. So again, thinking about kennel cough and how it was all the dogs that were boarded. Remember, a lot of boarding facilities use things like concentrated bleach to make sure that they're killing off various pathogens. And if you have poor air circulation, breathing in bleach can cause a sterile tracheobronchitis. So they may truly cough after being boarded, but it may not be infectious. So knowing what's in their environment, knowing if they have a genetic risk, brachycephalics, for example, already have pre-existing respiratory problems and they may be more predisposed to a severe form of disease. Are there known triggers? And you can see this little puppy that's in uh, this current video. Uh, this puppy had been brought into the veterinary clinic to get its first set of puppy shots. And a few days later, the owner called back irate because now the dog had labored respiration. And she said, he picked it up from your clinic. Ended up bringing the puppy back, did some thoracic radiographs. And one of the things that we had asked in the history was, um, what else, you know, is sort of a potential for respiratory disease in the environment? And we dove down and figured out this dog was actually being tube fed. Sure enough, on radiographs, it had an aspiration pneumonia. So finding out about triggers, knowing about things like heartworm preventative. Has this dog ever had prior clinical signs? So is it chronic and then an acute exacerbation? Thinking about, was it recent anesthesia? That's another tip off to aspiration pneumonia. And then finishing up with, what is its vaccination history? Has it been vaccinated and to what? So we take that history and then as we move to the next slide onto physical examination, there are two parts of the respiratory physical examination. The first is gonna be a distance exam and that's kind of what we're doing right here where we're just looking at the various videos, but we're not able to put our hands on the animal. 
it has two parts to it. The first is auditory, and that's unfortunately what's not working today. In the first and second videos, you can see um, that this is a dog that clearly has respiratory distress. It's predominantly on inspiration. The noise that you're not hearing is strider. I apologize for that. Um, in the third video, this is now a dog that has more of an expiratory component to the breathing. And again, what you can't hear is a wheeze. The last one is actually quiet breathing. So if you look at that little puppy, that's where the visual clues come in. So in all of these, we're listening for a noise. If it's a noise, we characterize it. Is it stirter? Is it strider? Is it wheeze? That helps us tell where in the respiratory tract things are predominantly affected. The um, visual part of it gives us more supportive information. So is it predominantly inspiratory, expiratory, or a combination of both? So following up on that fourth um, video there, that has both inspiratory and expiratory distress. So along with that, we'll do our hands-on physical exam using a stethoscope. We're gonna be listening for things like murmurs because heart disease can certainly cause respiratory signs. We're gonna be paying attention to adventitial or abnormal lung sounds. So if we go to this puppy as a clinical scenario, it was acquired from a breeder. The breeder admitted there had been an outbreak of respiratory disease. The puppy has both inspiratory and expiratory respiratory distress. So it has exposure. It has clinical signs that we're concerned are more severe. Take thoracic radiographs and everyone can appreciate this dog has a combination of both, in, sorry, combination of interstitial and alveolar infiltrates that would be very supportive of pneumonia. So now we have to ask ourselves, why does it have pneumonia? And the top differential in a scenario like this is going to be what we call community acquired pneumonia, that's SIRD. So the next slide gives us an overview of what SIRD really is. This is just an umbrella term that we use to apply to a wide variety of different bacterial and viral pathogens. The bacteria, you'll recognize you know, common things like Bordetella, even mycoplasma, the strep, and secondary bacterial pathogens. And then on the viral side, a huge variety, distemper, adenoparainfluenza, influenza, and on and on and on. And this list is not complete, and there certainly are other viruses that come along. So it's important to know what goes into SIRD. On the next slide, we're going to see that when we think about all the different bacteria and all the different viruses and how we approach these dogs clinically, so puppy is in front of us and it's coughing, all of the pathogens can cause identical clinical signs. There really isn't a pathognomonic feature that's a slam dunk. It is absolutely this particular pathogen or that particular pathogen. They can all lead to nasal discharge, all lead to cough, all lead to, in the worst case scenario, either systemic signs of illness like anorexia, lethargy, fever, and respiratory distress or labored respiration. It's also important to recognize that co-infections are very common. So when they acquire these infections out in the wild, it's often not just one thing. They can get more than one. So comprehensive knowledge of exactly which pathogen or pathogens are involved is key. New pathogens are always emerging. So having that appreciation that um, what we know today is not the end of it. We've got to always be a look on the lookout for additional pathogens that may be presenting in kind of a unique way. Severity of clinical illness, even though we always like to blame the pathogen, it's not all the pathogen's fault. So it's not just the virulence of the pathogen. It also depends on other environmental conditions and kind of the burden in the environment, as well as, and this is hugely important, individual host factors. So if you have a puppy that's poorly vaccinated, it might be emaciated or have heavy worm burden, it's going to be much more susceptible than an otherwise middle-aged, well-vaccinated, well-taken-care-of, you know, client-owned dog. So having an appreciation for all the other contributing factors because we can impact those. We don't have vaccines for all pathogens. So we're gonna focus more on the key pathogens that we can prevent disease in. 
The next slide shows what vaccines we have available, and they're generally broken down into two categories, the core vaccines and then the lifestyle vaccines. The core ones clearly being important because they can cause other um, more severe clinical signs like distemper or adeno. And then the lifestyle vaccines are the ones that we try to assess risk factors and then promote those based on an individual animal's own risk factors. The next slide highlights the importance of preventative strategies. So we're going to start off with the idea of anything we can do to support an individual's host immune response. That's going to decrease, in theory, the severity of the disease. So to support their immune response, obviously vaccination is a tried and true technique, picking those key pathogens that we know are common capable of causing morbidity, potentially mortality, and that they promote a very robust immune response. On top of that, we can do other things like stress reduction. This is real important when you have overcrowded um, you know, shelters or kennels or things like that because that's very stressful and cortisol can suppress immune responses. And then also promoting airway health, making sure that there aren't um, potentially harmful particulates or other aerosols or things in the environment that can non-specifically trigger inflammation. And so making sure there's also good air exchanges in whatever facility these dogs are in. Lowering the dose of the pathogen is important. Vaccination, in addition to protecting an individual, also decreases the amount of shedding that they do. So in theory, they're less infective to other dogs paying attention to sanitation and quarantining, and again here, air quality as well. So in the next slide, what I'm going to do is migrate a bit into the diagnostic approach that we take. So we've kind of brought together our history, our physical exam findings. Now we need to know if we think this is an animal that has SIRD, what is our general diagnostic approach? And in general, I'll say we have three approaches we can take. The first is considering an outbreak scenario. So knowing in an outbreak, diagnostic testing is critical. You really need to know which pathogen or pathogens you're dealing with because that's going to help you better mount um, all of the strategies that you're going to use to be able to um, not continue that outbreak going and be able to ultimately come up with a therapeutic plan. The rule of thumb is to sample 10 to 30 percent of the population. If you're talking about a large shelter or boarding facility, that may be cost prohibitive. So bare minimum, three to five dogs should be tested. And you want both affected dogs as well as dogs that have been exposed but may not be clinically symptomatic yet because there are some um, in particular, viruses like H3N8 that are most likely to be recognized when an animal has been exposed but not yet fully symptomatic. Now, if you have the second scenario, an individual pet dog that comes in and he's got a goose honk or barking seal kind of a cough, you really don't need to do a wide variety of diagnostics like the PCR panels to try to figure out which pathogen might be implicated because knowledge of the pathogen won't play into how you manage those dogs. The vast majority have self-limiting infection and you don't have to target a particular pathogen. Now that's a little bit different in the third scenario where you have an individual dog but now there's clinical signs of pneumonia. What we recommend here, in addition to doing things like a complete blood count, pulse oximetry, thoracic radiography, is ultimately getting a bacterial culture because one of the most important clinical questions we can ask is, is that bacterial pneumonia that the dog has antibiotic responsive? Or is the pneumonia antibiotic responsive? Meaning, is it bacterial or viral pneumonia? So on the next slide, I just want to pop up quickly a PCR panel. And let's say, you know, you come into work one day and a colleague leaves this on your desk and says, hey, can you contact so-and-so with the results and let them know what to do? How are you going to interpret this PCR panel? And I hope everyone is looking at this and saying, I have absolutely no idea because that is the correct answer. Pull up the next slide, please. 
What you need to know in order to interpret these panels is the context in which the swab was taken. So this is now from a four-month-old puppy. It was acquired from a pet store two weeks earlier. Pet store has known outbreaks of respiratory disease. This dog has had nasal discharge and cough for the prior 10 days, was vaccinated for distemper using a modified live vaccine one month ago, has been vaccinated for Bordetella, or has not been vaccinated for Bordetella, and then a sample was collected from a nasal swab today. So I've highlighted the three kind of trickier things in this um, to help you interpret or focus in on those three pathogens. So Bordetella, if you just swab a normal dog, you can find Bordetella in many healthy dogs. It's part of the normal nasal microbiota. But this dog is sick. This isn't healthy. So the fact that Bordetella is positive would lean you towards that as being caused causative of the dog's clinical signs. Let's go down to distemper. That's as positive. Back to that, yeah, down to distemper. So distemper being positive, normally you would think, oh my God, it's a dog with respiratory signs and it's PCR positive for distemper. That's most likely because this dog received a modified live vaccine one month ago. So the vaccine has genetic material present within it and that gets amplified in this PCR panel. Last thing I want to point out on this slide is H3N8 being negative. This dog has been symptomatic for at least 10 days. The vast majority of shedding which ate with H3N8 occurs prior to that, so certainly within the first seven days post-infection. So the fact that it's negative, you can't rule it out. So PCR panels, you have to understand how to interpret them and how to apply them. They're very tricky in individual pet dogs, which is why they're not recommended for individual dogs. It's more important in context of a larger outbreak. Next slide. So how do we treat them? This is kind of the last part of the talk we'll focus on. And everyone jumps to antibiotics. So what antibiotic is going to be the best to treat this complex? We first need to think about the fact that there are many, many different viruses and antibiotics are not good for viral infections. If we knew they had a viral infection, we wouldn't give them an antibiotic. And yet we don't know. And honestly, playing your odds, it's actually more likely it's viral than it is bacterial. We also have to struggle with the concept of antimicrobial resistance. And this in large part is our fault as a veterinary profession, because for decades we've been indiscriminately prescribing antibiotics for all cases of kennel cough. Last thing to think about is getting the bug to the drug. Often when there's an outbreak, people will call up the university and they'll chat with me about kind of what they're doing. And one of the antibiotics that is really commonly used for tracheobronchitis, so that's that goose honk barking seal kind of cough. I'm not talking about pneumonia, specifically tracheobronchitis, which is the most common manifestation of something like Bordetella and many of the other viruses. A drug like Clavamox, that's a great antibiotic. It's broad spectrum, it's bactericidal, and it won't work at all if they have tracheobronchitis. Not because it's a bad drug, but because it doesn't pass the blood bronchus barrier. Be aware, there's a blood bronchus barrier like the blood brain barrier, blood eye barrier, blood prostate barrier, and some antibiotic classes will not pass through that. So administering them, all you're doing is contributing to antimicrobial resistance. Next slide. So when do we use antibiotics? I want to give a shout out to this document by the International Society for Companion Animal Infectious Disease that gives antimicrobial guidelines, and it's both cats and dogs. So it'll be everything from, you know, snotty-nosed cats to dogs with tracheobronchitis or bacterial bronchitis, cases of pneumonia, pyothorax. It says when you should use antibiotics, which antibiotic to use, what dose to use, how long to use it, and some other considerations. To date, it has the strongest statement regarding antimicrobial use for canine infectious respiratory disease complex, and it says do not use antibiotics unless the dogs have clinical evidence of pneumonia. So what do we do? Next slide. Let's take each of our individual scenarios. So start with the individual pet dog that comes in, goose honk, barking seal, cough, but otherwise wagging its head 
its tail happy, healthy, otherwise. You don't give this dog antibiotics. What you're going to do is good client communication. That means telling them this is most likely a self-limiting disease and it doesn't matter if you give them antibiotics or if they get placebo, they're going to get better on their own. And the things the owners can do um, in addition to supportive care and isolating them would be get rid of that neck leash and switch it out to a collar. Minimize any triggers of paroxysmal fits of coughings. If the dog gets excited or barks a lot or, it, you know, goes on a walk and that's really where the cough is triggered during the healing phase, minimize those activities. Airway humidification, that's something owners can do, whether it's bringing the dog into the bathroom as they're taking a steamy shower or using something like a cool mist air humidifier. And if the cough is severe, you can certainly use antitussives, either the over-the-counter non-narcotic things like dextromethorphan, or if the cough is severe, I will, and it's usually at night, use the narcotic cough suppressants. They're both sedatives to help the dog sleep, and they are also very good at inhibiting that cough. There's no evidence that antitus, sorry, there's um, no evidence that steroids are going to benefit the dogs at this stage of disease. And if you do suspect these dogs have pneumonia, you don't want to do the antitussives either. Next slide. So what do we do if we've documented now that a dog has pneumonia? Ideally, in this scenario, you will have obtained an endotracheal wash or transtracheal wash to be able to get culture and sensitivity. But in the interim, if these are hypoxemic dogs and they're struggling to breathe, supplemental oxygen will decrease that work of breathing. So critical to help them in the more severe phases of the disease. Antibiotics are going to need to be administered empirically while you're waiting for your culture and sensitivity. Rules of thumb, you want to give something that is broad spectrum, bactericidal. Empirically, a lot of people will choose doxycycline. That's in fact the recommendation of the consensus guidelines that I showed you. Or in some scenarios, fluoroquinolones with something like ampicillin or clindamycin to get that real broad spectrum activity. Another thing that's critical is de-escalation. So that's essentially where you are going to um, pick just the one antibiotic that will do the trick. So if you do unison and fluoroquinolone and it's susceptible to the fluoroquinolone, just cold turkey them off of that unison. Judicious IV fluid therapy, nebulization and coupage, you're trying to get the mucociliary apparatus to function, and then avoiding certain things that could exacerbate the pneumonia, like cough suppressants, furosemide, and steroids. And then finally, think about nutritional support. Next slide. So what do we do in an outbreak scenario? And there are a couple of considerations in an outbreak. One is going to be the environment, and the other is going to be the animals in the environment. But a big rule of thumb to sort of get ahead of an outbreak before it really takes over in your clinic or if you have a boarding facility or work with a shelter is to train your receptionist to be able to identify dogs that have an acute onset of respiratory tract signs. And that's where you go back to your history and you try to assess what is the likelihood this is something that's contagious. And if it is, you have two options. One, they can drive in but wait in their cars and you can have some in full personal protective equipment, go out to the car and kind of triage and see how things are going. If it's a healthy coughing dog, don't bring that dog into your waiting room to cough on all the other dogs. Um, but if it is a dog that you're concerned might be more ill potentially with pneumonia, then you're going to be able to take those. And ideally, you'll have planned ahead, had a separate entrance, maybe an isolation area where you can care for them. Next slide. Diagnostic testing, as I said earlier, is critical if we're dealing with an outbreak. And here, this is broad-based net. You're trying to essentially figure out which of all the pathogens could be implicated. So doing the PCR panels, even doing some bacterial cultures can be helpful. Um, in the event that there is flu, there are some ELISA kits, and these are the same ones that are used in people. They just test for all flu A's. It won't tell you which subtype of flu you have. Um, but it will tell you if flu is present. And so that can be a very rapid cage side test. 
You're also going to want to think about strategies using all the tools in your toolbox to quarantine or isolate these patients, separate um, air spaces, separate entrances, barrier protection all come into play. Next slide. And then you want to control the spread. So thinking about disinfecting when and where it counts. So all the places that the dog has been and all the things that have touched the dog. So if you, you know, use your stethoscope, disinfect that, food and water bowls, that's another example. You also want to use knowledge of your testing to guide your specific recommendations, not just for things like what disinfectants do you use, but also how long these dogs have to be in quarantine. So I'll give an example. With influenza H3N2, the shedding period in that case is 24 days. If you have a dog in your clinic for a week because it's had terrible pneumonia, you finally nurse it through its illness, it's ready to go home, and it's looking great, like almost normal now. If you don't tell that owner she needs to quarantine that dog for an additional 17 days at home, that dog has the potential to spread this if it goes back to doggy daycare or back to the doggy park or comes into contact with other dogs. So use your knowledge of what pathogens are implicated to come up with your best management plan. Last slide. So I mentioned you're going to treat the environment in an outbreak. The other thing you need to treat are the individual animals themselves. And here's where we sort of put them into the two groups like we did the pet dogs. Vast majority with good supportive care, they're going to have self-limiting disease. And then there's a smaller population that either has overt evidence of pneumonia, or you might be worried are going to be very predisposed to developing pneumonia. So for example, if you have, you know, an immunosuppressed patient on chemotherapy or high doses of steroids, and they clearly were exposed in the outbreak, you might consider using antimicrobials in that select scenario. Don't underestimate, though, the powers of just good supportive care, boosting that host's immune system to help fight off the infection. And finally, I'm just going to end on, we all as a veterinary profession really need to be worried about antimicrobial stewardship and not indiscriminately using antimicrobials in all cases of canine infectious respiratory disease. So I believe we have some time for some questions. I'd be happy to take those now. Fantastic information. Thank you so much for that. Just want to reiterate to everyone again, please make sure to scan this picture, this QR code, so you can get your CE certificate. This is only for live attendance. Um, it is available for our Vecral Elite members whenever, but please make sure to scan it. I also went ahead and put the QR code link directly into the YouTube chat, so check that out. A couple of great questions. What do you tell pet owners, how long the quarantine should last? Two weeks, three weeks, knowing that they might not listen to us? What do you do? Yeah, and that's a tough question. Ideally, this is where if you know that there's a big outbreak and you've done the diagnostics, it will really guide how long that needs to be. So as an example, if you know it's Bordetella, the vast majority of Bordetella is going to spread when these dogs are clinically symptomatic. So if they're like still coughing, they're probably going to be considered potentially contagious to other dogs. But once that has stopped, then they're probably okay um, to go out in the environment. Sometimes you can still culture Bordetella for the, from them for up to like three months post-infection, but not usually in an amount that it's going to create disease in another dog. But if you have something like influenza, H3N2 was the example that I gave you, post-infective shedding, that's 24 days. So if you don't know, the best rule of thumb is to use the longest shedding period, that's H3N2, 24 days. So subtract off how many days they've been clinical, and the remainder is what you're going to recommend for their quarantine. All right. Another great question. Can you use mucolytics with NSAIDs and do you routinely, what's, what scenario do you actually use mucolytics? Yeah. So great question. Nobody has any clue on the veterinary side about which types of mucolytics and how to best use them and if they're even effective at all. 
Um, N-acetylcysteine is one example that has been um, sort of thrown out there. You definitely don't want to aerosol that to any cat that you ever have because it will cause bronchospasm. Um, in dogs, it will potentially, um, we've used it in cases where we've had dogs hooked up to a ventilator and we can do simultaneous pulmonary mechanics so we can typically see if their airway resistance goes up. When we've given N-acetylcysteine, airway resistance often like dramatically increases acutely because their secretions will liquefy, but then it clogs the airways for a short period of time. So you also have to be careful if you need to suction or somehow get that material out. Um, that's just a little caveat. Now, a lot of the other ones... Um, that are sort of used in people, there really haven't, to my knowledge, been studies showing their efficacy or not on the veterinary side. So the main mucolytic, which a lot of people don't recognize as a mucolytic that I would advocate using would be sterile saline, nebulizing that to a patient, um, because that will help thin the secretions and it doesn't do it in quite such a dramatic fashion as the N-acetylcysteine. And that's something you can use repeatedly. It also helps mucociliary function. You bring up a great point. It does seem like every 10 years, every decade, specialists will fight over what to nebulize. Saline, antibiotics, furosemide. So great information. And I totally agree. Just sterile saline mm -hmm. often is, is what I recommend. A um, couple other questions. Now, what do you do with a persistent cough in a very asymptomatic patient? Narcotic suppressants are helping with the cough. Um, does that patient need more of an extensive workup? Like, does it need a bronchoalveolar lavage? Do you do an endotracheal lavage or a BAL routinely in these patients? Yeah. So super important clinical question to ask is what do you do with these dogs that continue to cough and cough and cough? So my general rule of thumb is if this is truly, if their clinical signs are truly due to kennel cough, you should see substantial clinical improvement in seven to 10 days. If they're not substantially better, yeah, they probably do need to come back for a workup. But if it's getting better and the cough is persistent and it sort of just hits a plateau where it's not getting better, especially if it ends up exceeding eight weeks, so two weeks is kind of the magic number that we worry about for development of chronic bronchitis, absolutely, I would have them come back in and I would do um, a bronchoalveolar lavage probably radiographs first. You just want to make sure you're not missing something and then an airway lavage. That's not a one size fits all. You got to definitely evaluate the individual patient. So if, for example, it was a Yorkie and it acutely developed a cough that was severe, it got better, but it didn't go away. My top differential in that dog was it probably had tracheal collapse and the acute exacerbation tipped it over the edge to the point where it's now clinical, and that's what the owner is noticing. So every dog, you just need to kind of evaluate on its own, but having a prolonged cough is not a good thing. Like, that needs to be assessed. I will agree. As uh, both of us are criticists, we often feel like people are really intimidated to do endotracheal lavages or transtracheal washes. We totally get it, but um, ENLs are way easier than you think. Yes. Um, so please don't be afraid to do it. Really gives us so much information and it's more frustrating for us to do it after they've been on antibiotics for three weeks because we don't always find the underlying cause. Agreed. So, um, I, and I just wanted to give a shout out. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to give today's uh, Vet Girl Merck Animal Health YouTube Live. And for all of you guys, we hardly get thank yous right now. Uh, we are also burnt out. Curbside has been crazy. Summer is coming. Um, so thank you for all that you guys do for just rocking it and for taking the time for lunch break because we don't really get lunch breaks, uh, to be able to learn with us. Um, I'll pass it over to Garrett, but don't forget to fill out that QR code. And again, thank you for all that you guys do. I will reiterate, reiterate, Dr. Ranero again, thank you so much. A lot of awesome inf information, great feedback. QR code is in the bottom of this screen as well. So please make sure Justine had put the link within the YouTube chat function. We have the QR code. I'll bring it back for you. Give me one second there, nice and big for you. So again, I'm going to keep this open for the next 20 minutes or so. One 
o'clock Eastern time, we'll close that down. And typically within about seven days, you will get an email with the link to download, print and fill out your CE certificate. Don't forget, our Vet Girl platform has the option to upload any CE certificate regardless of who gave it to you. So you never have to look in your uh, desk drawer after 14 different moves and try to figure out how to find your CE certificate after you're finally audited 10 years from now. So just make sure you upload them into our CE platform. We do have another webinar coming up this evening. So make sure you check out our platforms to see our social media, et cetera, when our upcoming events are. We usually have a couple a week now. We're super excited. We branched out lots of tracks. As I said earlier, a multimedia approach to education. We enjoy listening and, and hearing from you as well. So if there are topics that you would like to learn about, shoot us a message in our contact form. That's how we engage amazing speakers like Dr. Reneros, because somebody said, hey, we'd love a respiratory talk. We find the best speakers to do that, and we put it on for you. So we're here for you. Again, thank you for all that you do each and every day. These are challenging times, but remember, you are making a difference to, to patients and their families. So Keep our head up, it's summer almost. We're excited to, to get back out in the open, maybe some outdoor dining here and there. And uh, if you have not, one final little plug, our Vet Girl U, we're still planning on having it live in about uh, just over two months now, August 5th through 8th. We only have uh, less than 50 spots left. Um, it's almost all sold, sold out. So if you're considering going to an amazing conference, we'll be in Chicago at the luxurious Fairmont Hotel in two months. We have a couple of spots left over. So check out our website, Vet Girl U, link at the top, register, come with us, come see us, come say hi to us, enjoy some great time. And with that said, I hope everyone has a great rest of their week and enjoyable summer. And I hope we see many of you in Chicago in just a couple of months. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. And Dr. Monero, thank you again for giving an amazing presentation.